August 2004, Dinesh Thakur walks through a garden leading to a grand building. The building belongs to the company he works at, the Indian pharmaceutical giant. He is on his way to meet Rajinder Kumar, the R&D head at the company. Thakur expects his boss to be cheerful after a successful meeting with the WHO officials and the South African government. But what he sees is the complete opposite. A grim-faced Kumar hands him a report from the WHO and says, Thakur, we are in big trouble. India is often referred to as the world's pharmacy because its pharma manufacturers fulfill over 50% of the world's vaccine needs and are one of the largest exporters of affordable generic medicines, which are drugs that have the same chemical composition and the same effectiveness of branded drugs but are cheaper. A patent act passed by the Indian government in the 1970s put India on the map of global pharmaceuticals. It opened the way for Indian pharmaceutical companies to manufacture and supply drugs to people and nations that could not afford expensive branded medications. This was said to be India's hero story in the pharma world. But unfortunately, there was a company that took advantage of this generic medicine revolution and it eventually came crashing down. Hi, my name is Pranav and you're watching Science is Dope. And in today's video, we're gonna dive into the story of two companies and how they both saw this law. One saw this as an opportunity to change the world with cheap and effective generic medicines, while the other saw this as an opportunity to use Jugard as a drug manufacturing strategy, completely ignoring how it might affect the health and safety of millions of people in India and across the globe. Let's begin. It's 2008 and Catherine Eban, an investigative journalist in the US, receives a call from the host of a radio show called People's Pharmacy. The host, who was also a trained pharmacologist, mentions that many people from across the country were writing to him, complaining about the generic medications they were prescribed. Some said that the medicines didn't seem to work and others said that the medicines were causing unwanted side effects. The host had informed this to the authorities but they shrugged it off, saying that it's all in their heads. People were feeling this way because the medicines were not made by their original brands and they were skeptical of generic medicines. But this logic didn't sit well with the radio host. He believed that the problems were real and wanted Catherine's help to figure it out. What the hell was wrong with these drugs. Catherine thought, hey, the FDA for sure would not approve drugs that were not up to the regulatory standard, right? So there must be some procedure to make sure the drugs were of quality. After going through pages of FDA rules and talking to a few experts, she found out that there were procedures to ensure generic drug safety, but they weren't foolproof. You see, instead of testing the drugs themselves, the FDA screened the company data and trusted the manufacturing companies. That's like way too much faith to have on companies that would profit millions from selling those generic drugs. A band quickly wrote up an article exposing the flaw in the system. As soon as it got public, she had tips coming in. One such tip said, if you really want to find out what's wrong, you need to look at the suppliers of these generic medicines. And who was the major supplier of these generic drugs to the US? You might have guessed it was India and China, and 40% of them were manufactured in India. This tip and some further digging pointed her toward an Indian pharma giant that was rapidly capturing the US generic market, a brand that most of us are familiar with. Ranbaxi. Ranbaxi Cherry Cough. Introducing Full Active. Khasi mein, mommy hamesha degi doctor trusted formula Cherry Cough. Revital cure se. Jio, ji bhar ke. Don't slow down, get going. Catherine found out that this company had been under suspicion for a while since one of its former employees turned whistleblower Dinesh Thakur showed that the company was falsifying drug testing data and not following ethical laboratory practices. As she started exploring more of Dinesh Thakur's experience at Ranbaxy, she discovered a highly unethical side of the company, which we shall uncover soon. But Catherine also came across the Robin Hood of the medical world an Indian 
Revolutionary and his drug manufacturing company that went against other pharmaceutical giants and set out on a journey to provide cheap and good quality drugs to treat HIV and AIDS, a mission that saved millions of lives in underprivileged countries. The man is Padma Bhushan Dr. Yusuf Hamid, a scientist and the chairperson of the company Cipla. These are the two companies we're gonna look at, the unethical Ranbaxy and the savior of millions, Cipla and the law that enabled them. The former world has often called Dr. Hamid a pirate or a thief, but that never stopped his crusade of making affordable, life-saving drugs available to everyone. His journey began in the 1960s when he returned to India after getting his PhD in chemistry from Cambridge University. He started working in the chemical, industrial and pharmaceutical laboratories in Mumbai that his father started in 1935 after Europe stopped sending medicines to India due to the World War. So when Dr. Hamid started handling the business, his father told him that we are not here to make profits but to bring relief and healthcare to the poor who may otherwise have to die for want of quality drugs and thus began his journey to break the monopoly in the drug industry. Remember the Patent Act we mentioned in the intro? Dr. Hamid had a major role to play in the act getting revised. Even decades after independence, India was still following many of the British patent laws. So the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi decided to revise previous patent laws and frame new ones. At the same time, Cepla brought India's first generic version of the beta blocker Propanolol, a medicine essential for treating blood pressure and heart diseases. Unfortunately, the British company that invented the drug didn't take it well and filed a patent infringement lawsuit against Cepla. Since the patent laws were being changed, Dr. Hamid thought this would be a good time to address the issues being faced by drug manufacturers in India regarding the international patent laws. So he reached out to the Prime Minister and said, Madam, here is the drug. Should millions of Indians be denied the use of a life-saving drug just because the inventor doesn't like the color of her skin? This set in motion the Patents Act 1970, the first patent act of independent India. This act stated that patents could only be applied to the drug manufacturing process and not to the drug molecule itself. And also, the process could only be protected for seven years. This launched India into the golden era of pharma. Within a few decades, India became a major supplier of quality generic medicines to underprivileged and first world countries. Until some higher-ups at Ranbaxy decided it was okay to compromise the quality of its own medicines for profits. Now back to 2004 at Ran Baxi's Gurgaon office. Thakur was holding the WJ report for the generic drugs that Ran Baxi was making for HIV and AIDS, which spread like an endemic in Africa. To make sure that the drugs were safe and of quality, the South African government had requested experts from the WHO to go through Ranbaxi's drug testing and trial data. Thakur opened the report and started reading it, but he couldn't believe what he saw. The WHO experts had found that Ranbaxi's clinical trial had completely faked their data. They copy-pasted data from two people and made it look like they tested the drugs on 95 people. His terror didn't end there because Rajinder Kumar told him that this wasn't the first time that Ran Baxi was doing such a thing. The company did multi-million dollar generic drug business in the US and for that reason, they had to undergo FDA approval. But Ran Baxi had been fooling them for quite a while. Kumar being the R&D head wanted to take this fraud to the company's board but didn't have enough evidence to show. So he asked Thakur to investigate how such a fraud went unchecked in the company and who was responsible. Over the next few months, Thakur came across several unethical practices being carried out in the manufacturing and testing labs of Ranbaxing. For starters, they used the loophole we discussed earlier. The FDA doesn't test the generic drugs themselves, they look at the company data. The data sent to the FDA looked fishy, so he interviewed an assistant who reluctantly told him that 50 to 60 percent of the data shown was fake. Sounds pretty alarming, right? Wait until you hear what percentage of data was being faked for the drugs being sold in India. 
it was nearly a hundred percent, meaning many drugs consumed by Indians were not even properly tested in a lab. Listening to this triggered a memory in Thakur. A while ago, his son was prescribed a Ranbaxy brand antibiotic for fever. But even after taking it, his son's fever didn't drop below 102 for almost three days. But as soon as the doctor switched the brand of the antibiotic, the fever got better. He didn't think much of it back then, but now it somehow made sense. Thakur found that this wasn't the work of a greedy plant manager or a laboratory head. Such behavior was rampant in Ranbaxy inside and outside India. I'll give you an instance that you're gonna find appalling. You would have seen these saunas and steam rooms for people to relax in. Many Ranbaxy officers had these but not for people to relax in. Guess what they were for? See, when a regulatory body asked to see drug safety and stability studies, they were supposed to be conducted over a period of 3 to 18 months. And the company didn't have any study data because they didn't conduct any studies. You know what they would do? A bunch of employees would fabricate the data overnight and steam the documents to make the crisp new papers look soft and old, to make them look like old study data. The level of Jugad at Ranbaxy was unbelievable. This wasn't the end of their risky behavior. Some drug manufacturing plants even added adulterants like wax for the medicine ingredients to mix well, while others decided to grind up and resell the drugs that were called back from the market when pieces of glass were found in them. After months of covert investigation, Takur had managed to gather some very compelling evidence against the labs manufacturing and testing the drugs. He filed the info into a four-page report for Kumar to present in a board meeting. Now, even though Kumar was optimistic that these problems would be rectified immediately after the truth came out, Thakur wasn't so sure and his fears came true. Thakur and Kumar were expecting the board members to be surprised by all these malpractices, but none of them were. Instead, one of them said, can you try and bury this data? Like, what the f***? Kumar wouldn't have it. He put forward an ultimatum, they better fix these problems or he would resign. Instead of stopping him, the regional director of Ranbaxy ordered all the copies of the report, the presentation and even the laptop used to be completely destroyed. After Kumar resigned to intimidate Thakur from carrying out further investigation, the company requested an audit on its employees, which was nothing but a way for the company to target Thakur. And to no one's surprise, the audit accused him of browsing pornographic websites during work. Thakur knew he didn't do it, then who did? So he asked the network administrator to do some sneaking around, which revealed that someone from the IT department had planted his IP address on many of the sites he was accused of browsing. This was a last straw for Thakur, because he left his job at a big name pharma company in the US to move back home and be a part of the system that was making affordable, effective generic drugs in India. But what Ranbaxy was doing was the complete opposite. He found that the company got approval from over 40 countries to manufacture drugs. Over 200 medicinal products based on their data that did not exist, but were created by data fabrication experts. So he picked up the courage to resign and become a whistleblower. And his first stop was the FDA. Two years after Thakur approached the FDA in 2007, a group of their officials raided Ranbaxy's US corporate headquarters. One federal agent announced to the entire office, I'm an FDA investigator, don't touch your computer, don't touch your phone, step away from your desk. These men had guns, so the employees freaked out and did as they were told. <laughs> Sounds like a Hollywood action movie, right? Guess what the agents found on one of the senior employees' desks? A document which in big bold letters said, do not give to the FDA. This file contained the data for a drug that was failing. But Ranbaxy was still trying to pass it off as a success and sell it in the US market. Over the next few years, the FDA started banning more and more drugs made by Ranbaxy as they discovered more unethical practices and false data. While the FDA was closing in on the firm in the US, back in India, Malvinder and Shivinder Singh the then directors of Ranbaxy Laboratories decided to sell their ownership of the company to a Japanese firm Daiichi Sankyo Pharmaceuticals for $4.6 billion. 
but they conveniently forgot to mention the entire fraud fiasco that happened. Finally, in 2013, the FD versus Ryan Baxi case came to an end as the company pled guilty, and the United States Department of Justice ordered Ryan Baxi to pay 500 million US dollars for false claims and data fabrication. Ryan Baxi's problems did not end there. Daiichi Sankyu also sued them for withholding information during the ownership transfer. An international court ruled in favor of Daiichi, and they were able to sell Ryan Baxi to Sun Pharma. The company that now owns the once crown jewel of Indian Pharma. Genetic medicines are a boon to the world of health. They can provide cheap, effective and life-saving drugs to millions of people. But companies that pull scams like Ranbaxated make the public lose their trust not only in genetic drugs but in science and scientific medicine. I want to highlight stories like these two because I want to show that it's not modern medicine that you shouldn't trust, it's human greed. Content like this is expensive for me to make. If you did like the video, I'd appreciate it if you support me on Patreon, buy me a coffee, YouTube memberships or that thanks button. You can also support me by buying my merch. Yes, I now have merch available. You can find it below this video or by going to my channel page and clicking the store button. You can see all the designs over here or by going to my website and clicking the shop button. You'll be taken to the Kadak Merch page. Kadak Merch are my partners uh, for the merch and you can see all the designs over here. Now the Science is Dope designs are on sale uh, so you can buy them. While the sale lasts, I'll be announcing new designs uh, soon. So the sale will be till then. After that, the prices are going up. So buy them while you can at this price. And remember, you'll be supporting me. If you like this video, you might also like this one I did on scammers that made people think that their water can make them healthy. I'll see you in the next one. Till then, remember, science is dope.